hello. I'm Carol Hilty, Superintendent of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, CSDB. Welcome. I'm happy that you have decided to watch this program. I hope that you enjoy it. We welcome your feedback. Diane Wrighton, and I just turned 40 this summer, so the big 4-0. So I've been wearing hearing aids since I was three, so about almost four decades now. And I lost my hearing about three years old, and probably from a high fever. So I've been wearing hearing aids since about two and a half, three years old. And when my Mom decided to put me in school, she decided to mainstream me. And what that means is I was put in the regular school system, public school, with other hearing kids. So I was the only one that wore hearing aids and spoke kind of funny, and so it wasn't very pleasant. And so I had several decades in the public school system of uh, being ridiculed, teased, bullied, even by the teachers. And so it just wasn't a very good school experience for me. Um, so I would say it was a good thing that my mom mainstreamed me because I got kind of tough and learned how to lip read and just learned how to survive. But it would have been nice if I could have been around some other hard of hearing or deaf people. Because I thought I was the only one in the whole world that wore hearing aids. So it would have been nice to have been exposed to something like the Deaf and Blind School. Title, Adult Life. I've always had a job. I'm a really fast typist. I can type at 100 words a minute, no errors. So that was always my saving grace that I could interview well, get in the office, and crank out the work. So getting a job has never been a problem. But having a career was something that I never really thought about, never really had any direction. But then I turned 30 and two things happened. And I'm in uh, Southern California at the time. I come across the Hearing Loss Association, which back then was called Self-Help for the Heart of Hearing. And they have these little chapters in the city where people who are like me, they go and hang out. I was like, there's other people in the world like me? Wow. So I go to a, a meeting and it was like, it's like the, the green curtain and the Wizard of Oz. It's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is a whole different world. And I met my best friend, Tracy, and she's still my best friend. She's an amazing woman, 10 years older than me. She's deafer than I am and has done more with her life. So she's, she really encourages me to do better. And I just got involved in the hearing impaired world. I started learning about assistive listening devices. I started learning about digital. Huh, do you mean these things I have in my ears are no good? I can go get something better? So I started learning, being around people that weren't making fun of me anymore. They were just my friends. So it's really a great experience. Title, Communication Skills. My speech was so bad, it was slurred, it was really loud, and it was really high pitch, and I talked through my nose a lot. And every time I speak, people would just look at me like, what is wrong with her? And so it, it caused people to react to me in a negative way because they thought, well, if she talks like that, she must not be mentally all there. She must not be very intelligent. So that's how I was treated. 
So I thought, okay, I gotta go to a speech therapist and try to work on this. So while I was doing that, I realized that I needed a safe environment where I could go and practice speaking. Because it's one thing if you sit there with a speech therapist, you're gonna do it okay, but as soon as you go out into the real world, you kind of go back to your old habits. So I saw an ad for Toastmasters International, biggest nonprofit in the world that helps you with communication skills. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if they could help me just learn how to speak a little bit better. And my whole life changed because I have another new group of friends that were positive, they weren't making fun of me, everybody was into self-improvement and learning how to be a better person, better speaker. I was like, wow, this is really cool. So then I got to be able to go around and speak to the hearing impaired community about hearing impaired issues because of the skills I learned in Toastmasters. So because of those two organizations, I got a whole new set of friends, got new skills, all of a sudden I have some confidence, my voice is starting to lower, I'm starting to slow down, I'm not talking quite as fast, I'm just starting to be able so that people can understand me better. I'm just enunciating a little bit better. So then I thought, wow, okay, maybe I could really go do something with my life. Title, career. So then I decided I wanted to be a financial planner because I really didn't do well with managing my money. So I thought, well, if I go into the money management world, maybe I'll learn how to manage my finances better. Just happens that my Toastmasters mentor was a financial planner. And so he got me my first job into that whole industry. And because he knew that I would work hard and that I would take what he was trying to teach me seriously, that he gave me a chance. So I had a whole decade, this last decade, of being in the financial planning world. It hasn't always been easy because I still don't hear that well. And I still have to explain myself to people. But because I try to be a good person and I, I try to help other people and be kind, the disability just doesn't seem to be an issue as much as it was when I was younger. And maybe the speech helps too because I'm not just, I'm not as distracting, I think, as I was when I was younger. So it's been a neat journey to see how such a late bloomer in life, I just turned 40, it's only been in the last 10 years that I could really hear with my new digitals, that I could really have friends that weren't sitting around making fun of me. It's, I feel like a 40-year-old in a 20-year-old body because I'm just, I'm just kind of getting going a little bit. Title, Advice for Teachers and Parents. Advice for teachers, if you can get your kids in school to just read, read, read. One of the first books I got was the Franklin Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think everybody should read that book. And they have one for teenagers and, and little guys. Just getting your kids to read. Read a lot of self-help books. I know it sounds kind of psychobabble, but I think it's really good to just read a lot of books on how to deal with what you're feeling with your disability because it's, it's not a lot of fun. So if you, if you can encourage people to do reading, I think they'll find a lot of the answers themselves. And for parents, I think parents need to be really careful about the bullying because hard of hearing and deaf kids get bullied in, in a different way than maybe some other kids do. I mean, I would be bullied in such a way where people would take super glue and warm it up and put it on my seat so that when I sat down, it would burn a hole through my leg. And the teachers would just laugh along with the kids. And so there's a bullying that's going on that I think we need to hold parents and teachers accountable to say, that, that's unacceptable. It never dawned on me when I was little that I should speak up that I didn't have to just sit back and take that. When my mom and dad hear what happened, it, it makes them so sad because they didn't know, because I never said anything. So if the parents can just create a safe environment where you, know, you don't have to be a wimp and just be crying at every little thing that happens, but if you're really seriously being made fun of and bullied, you need 
to call that person on it and, and you need to get some help because everybody deserves respect. From the time someone is little to say always be kind but say no to being mistreated, that will do so much for that hearing impaired child to know that it's, it's okay to speak up when somebody's making fun of you or not being accommodating. So I think that's just a big thing that teachers can do. And I think from what I'm hearing in the industry and in the, the school system, I think teachers are doing a better job of that than they were 20 years ago when I was in school. Um, I think there's a little more political correctness that this helped that a little bit. Title, Keys to Success. I think the rules of success are the same. Whether you have a disability or don't, you need to work hard, you need to be punctual, you need to be kind, you need to be helpful. And if teachers and parents can provide an environment where someone can do that, they're going to be successful. It doesn't make, make it easy, but it, it gives them a, a foundation so that they can have a successful life. Title, Assistive Devices. So I really like the captioning on the television. I don't usually go out to the movies. I always rent movies because I can have the captioning. It's really helpful. And then I had the digital hearing aids. And I'm just getting ready to go to the next level of digital technology, which is exciting because I have a really hard time with the office phone. Well, evidently with these new hearing aids, it's a little device that I can put in front of my phone. And when my office phone rings, instead of picking up the receiver, I'll just push the button on that device, and the person on the other end of the phone gets streamed to my two hearing aids. I can't wait to check this out. I mean, it's going to be great because I don't have the feedback from that handset. So it's like every couple of years, the, the digital technology is just phenomenal. So I'm excited about that. Title, Communicating with People Who Are Deaf or Hard of Hearing. Well, they call the hearing disability the invisible disability because you can't always see the hearing aid because of the hair or you're not close enough to the person. So because it's the invisible disability, the onus is kind of on us to assist and help those of us that are trying to communicate with us. So sometimes I come across the hearing or the deaf person that the hard of hearing person or deaf person that have an attitude, they just think that everybody should just figure out how to communicate with me. And it, it doesn't really make for a very smooth communication style. So if, if I can just be up front and say, please don't try to talk to me when you're in the other room or with your back turned to me, people are always, oh, okay, no problem. So I think just helping the people around you understand that it is an invisible dis disability. People forget that I'm hard of hearing. They try to walk down the hall in the office and say something, and I'm like, hello, <laughs> I didn't hear a word you said. Oh yeah, okay. So I th it's that constant reminder, but it's really our responsibility to help people around us figure out how to communicate with us. It's, and a lot of times they see it switched around, and I think that's unfortunate, and I don't think it needs to be that complicated or that difficult, but um, people get embarrassed about their disability, and so I think if you can just take ownership of it and say it is what it is, and I'm going to do the best I can to help you communicate with me, then people are like, oh, okay, well, she doesn't think it's a big deal, so I'm not going to think it's a big deal. So it, it just makes it easier for everybody that way. Learning from adult role models who are deaf or hard of hearing has been a production of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, 33 North Institute Street, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80903-719-578-2100, www.csdb.org, videography by Deb Branch and Sean Levier, copyright 2014. Audio description, Jim Olson, editing assistants, Diane Kevington, Dr. Laura Douglas, captioning, Neil Anthony Thomas, Corey McCormick, transcription, Eleanor Vasquez. American Sign Language is a visual language. 
and it is not universal. Same holds true with spoken language. For example, English, Spanish, French, they're all distinct languages. Same holds true with sign language. There's British Sign Language, French Sign Language, Mexican Sign Language, and they are all distinct. When it comes to ASL and English, they are not the same language. They have their own grammar, their own rules, and their own order. They are two distinct languages. Eye contact is extremely important within the deaf culture. And the reason being is, is when people are signing with one another and that eye contact is broken, it is considered rude. Deaf people, in general, when they are signing, if that eye contact is broken, they will wait for the participant to make that eye contact again and continue signing. Which hand should you use when you're signing? For signing and fingerspelling, you have a dominant hand and a non-dominant hand. Let me give you an example. I'm a righty, I write right-handed, and I would sign in this fashion. Hello, my name is Cindy with my dominant right hand. Now, if you write lefty, that would be your dominant hand, and the right hand would be your non-dominant hand, and the signing would look like this with the, hi, my name is Cindy. Take a look at this. My name is Cindy. That is not what you want to do. Again, if you write righty, sign with your right dominant hand and stick with it. If you write lefty, you sign with your dominant left hand and stick with that. Don't alternate between the two. Just pick one and stick with it and use that dominant hand. Okay, so you're learning sign language. Here's a tip. You need to look at the face because that's where the expressions are and they will change the meaning. Let me give you an example. I understand. I'm not understanding. It's critical to look at the face. Don't focus on the hands. Here's an example. My daughter, Ashlyn, she loves shopping. She loves to go to the Chapel Hills Mall. My daughter, Ashlyn, she just loves to go shopping at the Chapel Hills Mall. When you're sharing a book with your child, it's very important that you relate the contents of the book to include the people, the objects that are in the book related to the environment. Let me give you an example. There's a book entitled Cookies Week, and that book is about a cat, a mischievous cat that makes his way into a house and gets into a lot of different things within the house, different objects. There's a picture in the book of a trash can that's tipped over. So at that point in time, you can turn to the child and ask them, take a look at this, take a look at the trash can, and ask them, where is yours? Uh, the child could actually physically get up and show you or could point to the object. There's other pictures of a toilet overflowing. That's an opportunity to ask the child, where's your toilet? And while you're reading the book, it's imperative that you relate it to the real world. And that will improve upon their vo vocabulary as long as you relate the book to the environment. OK, you and I just read this book, right? Do you have any animals that in your home, like a cat or a mouse? Do you have any animals at home? Do you have animals in your home? Yeah, no, none. So you don't have any pets. Do you, you don't have a cat? Do you want one? No, I want a dog. Oh, so you want a dog. OK, and what would you name the dog? B-U-G, bug, right. Did you see how the bug hopped? Have you seen that? At your home, where you, have you seen bugs? What color, do you have a cat? 
It's a big cat. No, 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 no. In your own home, what color is your cat? Mm, yellow? Yellow, huh. Okay. So while you're reading, perhaps you could bring the printed pictures that go with the book. And you could use real toys, for example. You could, uh, let's say the book talks about a ball. You could ask your child to actually bring a ball over to you, and that correlates with the book that you're reading. And you can sign the book to them. You remember I talked to you about the constellations. At night, you see them. Uh, you might see crabs or scorpions. Sometimes you'll see uh, teapots. It actually looks like a teapot. Or maybe you see all these different things. Yeah, I've seen them before. Yeah, I have. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've seen them. So you have seen the constellations. The wolf is chasing. What, what are they doing? What is it doing? It's flying. Yeah, it is flying. It's flying to the moon. The horse is flying to the moon. Yes, yes, it, it's flying. The horse is making its way to the moon. The horse, let me see. You want to add some wings to this horse? Hmm, let's think about it. But it's still going to be a white horse. It's similar, yes. Mm -hmm. What else? Where's the crab? Yeah, it's a scorpion, but there's a crab. What about that? Oh, what about the platypus? Do we have a platypus? No. OK. Where's the wolf? Where is the wolf? This? There's two wolves. Remember, they're chasing one another. Actually, there's three wolves, right? And what are they doing? What are those wolves doing? Chasing each other. But who are they chasing? That. But who? The horse and the girl. They're chasing the horse and the girl? OK. OK, we're done with the ASL story. Now let's come up with a game that you can play with your child. The book is called The Very Hungry Caterpillar. This book talks about different types of food. And what you can do is maybe in a circle of some sort, you could ask the children, there's a picture of, let's say, an orange. And then you ask the child to go actually find an orange in the home and have them bring it to you, uh, bring the actual fruit to you, and then the next one up does the same kind of thing. And you say, oh, here's a strawberry. And they have to actually go and find a strawberry. You could also incorporate fingerspelling as well, and that will improve upon their vocabulary. Another great game that you can do is you have a book, again, the same book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Again, there's different foods within this story. There's strawberries or ice cream. You can actually make a Xerox copy of these pictures and lay them out and mix them up and then ask the child to find the orange within the mixed pile. And then you can play a matching game. So that actually correlates with the story as well. When you finish reading a story with your child, you can actually play a game. You could play an animal game. You can take turns. Or you could go around in a circle. You could play an alphabet game. Just think of something that starts with A or a letter that's, uh, something that starts with B. Do you want to play a game, an animal game? So I'll give an animal, and then you come up with another animal, and we go back and forth, OK? Can't be the same animal. Oh, I don't know. But all right, give it a try. All right, I'm going to start with fish. You come up with a different animal. What's a different animal? What's another animal? Cat, OK. Hmm, my turn. How about a bat? All right, you're up. Uh, butterfly, OK. I'm going with elephant. Your turn. Mmm, a horse, okay, that works. All right, giraffe. Mmm, 
think. Uh, a frog? Okay, yeah, that works. Do you want to play an ABC game now? Want to play a little something different? Do you know how to play those? I don't know. That's okay. What you need to do is think of an animal that starts with the letter A. So, for example, alligator. Now it's your turn. You're B. Give me an animal with a B. Mm. Mm. Bunny. Oh, all right. Perfect. Bunny. Okay, I'm C. Let me think. We already, you already mentioned cat. What's another animal that begins with C? A cougar? How about that? All right, you're up with D. Mm. A dog. Okay. All right, very good. All right, now E. Elephant? I already said elephant. Let me think of something else. How about an eel? You know, the long, slippery little animals? Yeah, it almost looks like a snake. It's an eel. All right, you're F. It's really important that you help your child to make those connections to the book and make those connections with the environment. And again, it'll improve upon their vocabulary in doing so. But again, make those connections, and there'll be better comprehension. Mm -hmm.